It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Thursday, February 16th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is already getting the coffee ready for Flyers after dark over the next few days. Tea. Iced tea. Ah, okay. Well, we got to face the Kraken late tonight. We're going to talk about that, and then we're going to get into trade deadline goals and how to achieve them, as well as checking in on Cutter Gautier. Lots to talk about, and we'll get started now. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Lockdown Flyers. That's where you'll keep up to date on all the Flyers news, our episodes. You can also email the show at LockdownFlyers at Gmail. Locked on Flyers is free and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. So subscribe. You'll get all of our episodes here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Plus, we're over on YouTube. So subscribe there as well. Russ, uh, we've got Flyers versus Kraken part the second tonight. Mm -hmm. And Just a quick programming note, because of that, we're not going to put out the Friday episode until uh, Friday morning, uh, because again, with the late game, we're going to we're going to record Friday morning. So uh, keep an eye out in your feeds then. But um, what's interesting about this? like home and home against the Kraken for the Flyers is that the Kraken actually played a game in between. Yeah. It's not really a home and home for them, uh, but the Jets beat the Kraken in a shootout uh, between that last game and the upcoming one tonight. And I think, you know, there's, there's a few things that have to go better. I would say first off cover Justin Schultz better. (laughs) Can't let him have another good game like he had last time but i also think uh the flyers really need to watch their coverage right I, they were getting just oh yeah caught putt watching and you know with the speed that the kraken have to some degree you know they were just getting drawn in too close on either side of the ice depending on the play they really have to keep an eye out for that and make sure they're covering back door and those passes especially through the neutral zone that the kraken can pull off yeah, first and second periods weren't great. They had the scramble in the third, kind of made it close, but but the Kraken were taking it to them for a while. And you know, look, they they you know they made a minor move. They shored up their defense. They're a fast team. Flyers have trouble with fast teams. Uh, Flyers are going to have to you know have a, a good game plan, and they're going to have to try and do better on the power play. Like at the end of the day, you know that could be a difference of the game again if it goes to overtime. Well. They're one and nine in overtime, so we know about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I please, especially since the game is that late. Regulation, whatever the outcome yes. is of the game. But no, of course we want the Flyers to win in in whatever fashion it takes. But I think that um, you know, this like we said on yesterday's show when we talked about the to-do list for this particular road trip, I think it's important that the Flyers start off right. Mm -hmm. And really just, you know, not just because they lost to the Kraken in the last game, you know, and you want to kind of get that one back, but also because, you know, this is an important stretch of games, especially because, you know, since the break, things haven't been as uh, strong overall that they were versus before the all-star break and so it'd be good to kind of get back on the horse and like winning more often and having more sustained quality play during most of the games no question about that plus they've had a lot of time to practice so you know they can't say they haven't had practice time they have and so you know let's see some results 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. So we will be back tomorrow to discuss the outcome of that one. And uh, hopefully we'll be discussing a victory. In the meantime, you know, the, the trade deadline is obviously what's on everybody's mind, not just Flyers fans. I think, you know, this is something that's around the NHL. We've already seen some big deals go through. And, you know, it's it's a little nerve wracking because we know that the Flyers have a lot to accomplish in this trade deadline if they're going to have a chance at getting any better next season to really set up the following season. I think that's really where we are right now. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think management and the coach have a full plan of what next season is going to look like or what they hope it to look like. And so now they, you know, they brought another voice in and I think they're all going to be at the round table on, you know, the draft day, draft day on the trade deadline day. And, you know, they'll try and figure things out, but there's a lot of layers now. And so I don't know how quickly the Flyers can make a deal. I don't expect them to be among the first to make deals. I mean, they haven't been already, so they've already been trumped on that. Um, but the idea is let's see them. Are they able to get aggressive? Is this addition uh, and management going to make them more aggressive? I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard anything where there's any kind of real things happening. And I'm sure Chuck is doing his due diligence, but there's not any real big rumors with the Flyers. And so that's where it's at at the moment. Yeah, I think it's going to be real tough this year with as many teams as there are making earlier deals before trade deadline day in order to maximize the value of potential assets, it is a delicate balance. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong, you know, but it just doesn't seem as though there's any bidding war out there for any of the flyers assets. So it may be that they'll have to take, you know, if they're going to take less than what they think they should get for anybody on the Flyers right now, they should do it earlier rather than later. Because the later they go, I firmly believe in this situation with the Flyers, the later that they get to the actual deadline deadline, the less they're going to get in return. Yeah, I agree. I mean, especially now being on the West Coast, if if it's a West Coast team that has interest in JVR, then try and push that you know timeline up on a deal. It's not going to matter. I mean, they have enough guys on the trip. They could always get one out there. Again, with the magic of the airlines, uh, that could happen. And so nothing should really hold them back. But I think John Tortorella might hold them back. It's entirely possible that that happens. I think, you know, for me, one of the biggest goals for the Flyers should be to get, if one, if not two second round picks for the next couple of drafts. So I'm okay with getting a 2024 draft pick, but I think that, you know, getting a 2023 would be better, obviously, but the Flyers don't have second rounders for the next two drafts. And I think those are crucial picks. And given the assets that the Flyers have, for me, the goal is to get to is the reach, get both drafts covered in terms of having a second round pick. Um, and, you know, if you have to settle for one, fine, based on the deals that you make. But that, that would be my first goal. Yeah, I mean, for JVR, if it's 2024, fine. I get it. Uh, he hasn't had a great season. I totally understand. If it's for, like, Provorov, Sandheim, Konechny, then you want it to be 2023, exactly. especially if it's a contender. Uh, the pick's already going to be, you know, in the late 20s, you know, push for that push for that in the first round if it's um because if you get a second round it's going to be a really late second and you know if you get like a second and two thirds you know you start dealing with that you're now like yes you have more picks so you have more chances but now you have more low percentage chances and that's that's a worry too you don't you know sometimes um gms will go out there and get this basket full of picks but again a lot of times that could come up empty in the end. Yeah, I think, you know, that is a huge factor there. Uh, the Flyers, at least for me, should have some other goals in mind. And we are going to talk about those and how to get there coming up next. The midway point of the NBA season is here. And now there's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
Because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000, that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything for the money line to point scorers and threes drained. Uh, tonight, you can go maybe uh, Phoenix over the Clippers. Uh, that looks pretty good. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. So, Russ, uh, getting back to the Flyers trade deadline goals. You know, I mentioned before, really next season to me is about putting together the puzzle pieces and moving things around in the Jenga. I'll figure out as many games as I can come up with to talk about as a yes. metaphor. But like it. uh, you really it's setting up the 24-25 season as to be to be the big step forward. Right. And the reason why I'm thinking along those lines is because. First of all, that's when the Tony D'Angelo contract is up. And so I, that'll clear a significant amount of cap space this that year. And I think it'll be able to create an opportunity for the Flyers to really shape what the blue line is going to look like on the team then. Uh, and then the other factor is that Carter Hart's contract will be up that year. And so the Flyers are, or I firmly believe he will still be a part of this team. Uh, you know, knock on wood that some crazy doesn't happen. And, um, you know, they're going to either have to re-sign Sandstrom if, if he's who they go with and, or sign Sam Erson then. And so as the backup, you know, in terms of having a clear goalie core. And so given those, I think, two important factors here, that's why everything really has to point toward getting the cap ready for that particular season more so than next season where they can just kind of put some band-aids there as they need to, to get through it, to set themselves up properly for that following season. Yeah. It's going to be a real battleship at the uh, trade deadline and a connect four in the, uh, in the <laughs> summer. Uh, but <laughs> I would say this, uh, I tend to agree with you about the goalie situation, but you never know if he is getting frustrated and you don't know as far as Carter Hart, you don't know um, if he's all in on this game plan. Cause if we're a little, you know, muddy about it, I'm sure the team is too. So that's something that has to get defined this summer when they go talk yeah. to him and have an idea exactly. of if he's going to stay, because that's what they should do. Uh, as far as the deadline, you've got to clear as much cap space as possible. And yep. so, you know, again, even if you feel like if the team feels like Nick Sealer is such a good deal, whatever, fine. He's not as much as cap space as far as just a little bit of cap space, a pick, whatever. You've got to gain assets. You've got to gain any kind of cap space you can get. Because, again, you because they're not going to rebuild fully, they're not going to. Right? They're not going to admit that, say that, whatever. They're still going to do some things uh, in free agency. And so you want them to have – some ability to do some moves that, you know, the coach signs off on that. He says, yeah, I need that kind of player because, you know, you're going to have to, that's going to have to happen. He took over a team this year that he probably wouldn't want half the players. So, you know, you have to clear out what he doesn't want. You're going to have to make, get as many picks and cap space as you can. So even if it's, you know, one guy that you have to trade early, whether it's a Konechny or a Sanheim or a Provorov, you might have to eat that and just, you know, as a fan yep. and just say, all right, I understand it's the only way we can go forward. So don't be shocked if something like that happens now or at the draft. Yeah, I definitely think. And if you add Risto to that list. Yeah, he could be too. Yeah, I think in terms of, of those four guys, I think them trading one, maybe two of them away is the right way to go. I'm not saying I like it entirely. Just, you know, as you know, I, they're good players. I like them. I, I like for the most part, you know, there's been some weaknesses here and there, but for the most part, I like what they've done on the team so far. So it's not like, you know, I'm trying to 
throw away guys that haven't contributed. But I think there is a sacrifice that is going to have to be made to your point in order to get to a point where as long as, you know, you have the need to get some more high end players, these aren't high end players. They're good players. Right. And, and you... that, and that's what they talk about getting those high end players. Plus assuming we get a quality draft pick this year and cutter Gautier are going to come in. Like I said, in that following year, right. There'll be space for them. Right. I mean, the thing is, as an example, Provorov would probably be the guy I'd want to hold on to the most because you don't want Cam York kind of getting shoehorned into that number one spot where he's clearly not right. close to ready. So he's the the one guy I would keep behind and work on trading the others simply because I don't have a replacement for that guy and I can't get a replacement for that guy on the open market unless you're getting somebody for like a one-year deal. So so that's that's probably the guy I have to, you know, it have to be a blow me away deal to include that person in it. So that's where you look at for that. But otherwise, yeah, I'm with you on and everything else. And I just, again, I want to see everybody on the same page at this trading deadline. We'll find out if everybody was on the same page and that's the worry because, you know, I don't see it yet. Right. And I think, you know, for me, for next year, like looking ahead to next year and how right. that affects this trade deadline, I would like them to not sign a whole bunch of veteran depth guys like they did Correct. this past year. The, next year is the year that most of those roles should be filled with our current prospects. I think a bunch of them are ready or will be ready by next season. You know, if we have Ali Lixel, if Tyson Forster makes a run of it to make the team for next year. You know, if Adam Yinning comes up, if Zamula is ready to Ronnie come Adder up, could be Ronnie Adderd could be in the mix as well. And I think there's plenty of guys who are at that level, at the bottom six level in our system already that will be on expiring RFA contracts or still on ELCs that are ripe for getting the NHL experience that they need next season when the pressure is not as high. I think that's the perfect scenario for them. And so in order to do that at this trade deadline, sell off some of the ones you have now, like sealer, right? Yeah. Like Justin Braun and get as many draft picks as you can possibly get. This is where the money part of Tony D'Angelo kills you because mm -hmm. you know, you're spending money for him to be like a middle pairing defenseman and he's not he's you know he's number five who plays the power play and so because of that that money if you didn't have that five million you could possibly go out and get somebody like matt dumba or somebody like that who could play the top pairing but you can't do that now so right. this is where it, and you can't really trade the angelo i don't think he's had the kind of year nope. where teams are going to want him so so you you know that contract's going to hurt for another year and it does kind of clog up what's going on and so that's you know that's where these contracts can hurt you. Uh, that one is definitely one of them. And, you know, again, if somebody comes calling for Travis Konechny, hey, you got to make the deal. I get the kind of year he's having, but we also know that, you know, when the Flyers are ready to play um, playoff hockey, he's going to have to play more responsible, and that's probably going to cut down on his points, so maybe it's better to trade him in his high point year. Uh, that's it's never a bad move. So that's what you have to look at. There's still going to be a moment where these other young guys come in and they're going to need a year or two to develop. And that's why if someone asks me, I think it's at least three years off until they're anything. And I think they pushed it off by a year and a half and that that's hurt them. Yeah, I think so too. And again, like we're saying, clear that cap space. Like yep. you have never cleared cap space in your life, Chuck yep. Fletcher. <laughs> that is uh, the watchword because that's the only way they're going to be able to get from point A to point B, you know, two years from now. And um, I I'm not going to say the phrase because I swore I would never say the phrase again on the show earlier. Uh -huh, Russ, uh -huh. you might know. Uh -huh. You might know what that is, but I, there is a path is, is the point I'm making here that right. there is a path as long as the, they manage this trade deadline and this next off season in the right way to get there. And it, the next few weeks are going to be very critical in the development. Yeah, you can't have any more short-term 
spending for a lot of money like D'Angelo. Like that doesn't get right. them anywhere. That it has to be it has to be more long term focused. Not long term for years necessarily, but long term. Like, hey, uh, if we have this player for three years, we think by year three it's worth having him. Uh, he'll help other players develop. He's not too much money. That kind of player, sure, I, I get it. But you can't just sign, you know, couple years for a lot of money because it's still not gonna have the effect that you want. So you do really have to look at those things. And so again. And again, and again, and and they shouldn't get trapped into the twenty five or under. I think that's just marketing, because if there's somebody twenty seven or twenty eight who wants to sign with you for three or four years, and it's the kind of player you really need, then guess what? Go do it. It doesn't matter. Yep, yep. Of course, those are off season moves that we'll yeah. be looking forward to. And most uh, likely, also... it's in the trade too, like some sort yeah. of extension, one year left on the guy, that kind of thing. Exactly. All right. Well, part of the plan is having Cutter Gautier be a big part of it. And, you know, he's been pretty busy since World mm -hmm. Juniors. So we figured we would check in on him and we will do that coming up next. So Cutter Gautier, like I said, has been pretty busy since World Juniors. Uh, 11 games played for Boston College. In that time, he's got four goals and 11 assists. He was one of the guys that Boston College picked to nominate in the Hobie Baker process. This is very early days. It's not, you know, he's not a finalist, but uh, he is the, one of the nominees from Boston College. And he leads the team in points right now, despite having played a few fewer games mm -hmm. uh, because of his time in the World Junior Squad. So in 24 games, he's got 14 goals, 13 assists for 27 points. Yeah, I think right now, Cutter Gauthier looks great offensively, right? Like, I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of things going right, <coughs> excuse me, right for him. And, and you know, and his, um, and one of the other guys on the team, Nestorenko, Nikita Nestorenko, we'll talk about because there's a there's yeah. things to look at because Nestorenko is two years older than Cutter Gauthier. And there's a right. big difference with that. And it's a noticeable difference with that. So with Cutter Gauthier, yeah, he's scoring clutch goals. His shot looks great. Those things are great. But I got a laundry list of some things that aren't so great. So as an example, against Northeastern, he's been really bad on faceoffs. Why? Because Northeastern is a pretty damn good team. You saw them win the uh, the bean pot, and they're always really good defensively, and he's probably going up against 23-year-olds on those faceoffs. And so that's something right there where you look at it. One game, he was three for, three for seven as an example. So clearly he didn't even take every face off. They clearly went to somebody else uh, because he was kind of getting his lunch fed to him. So there's that. Uh, his, de his defense definitely needs, needs work. He is staying in the middle and he is engaged, but he's not really being overly physical and not being that quick to the puck. And those things are something where he can't live like that in a John, John Tortorella system, right? So yeah, he can get exactly. away with it right now in BC because it's working and he's the leading scorer and that's great. But beyond that, if he wants to be a center, he can't do that. So there's there's that. Um, and we I, saw that to a, a small degree in World Juniors, yes, right? Yes. That was like a big part of what we saw that he needed to work on in that tournament. Yeah. Uh, at times, you know, he even has too much energy. Like, and that leads to some bad decision making. Uh, it's not often, but I've watched some where it's just like, man, he's just trying to do too much out there. Mm -hmm. And and that's fine. I mean, it's again, it this is where you could work all that out. You work all that out in college. That's what that's there for. He um, you know, he's he's not blocking shots at all, really. Very few. No, I did see that in his stats, and I was like, that's really low for a center. Yeah, for a center, especially in the NHL. I mean, he's done it. Trust me. I've seen him do it in the NTDP, but he is going to have to start to do it even at the college level if he wants to play center in the NHL. So that's something he's going to need to do. He's a minus um, on the year where Nestorenko is a plus, and it just shows you that he could be a plus too. So that's something where – he has to work on it. And there was a play against Maine where there was a loose puck against the wall and he lost the race. He lost the race and the guy from Maine took it down and got a goal. And so those are things where even his skating still needs more work. And so this is why I'm voting, and I know you are, for him to stay in school. And I think he will. And I think these are the reasons why. Again, 
if you were just playing left wing and you wanted to put him into the Flyers organization and you were a absolute worst team in the league and you were desperate, I still would say don't do this. But then I could get, I could understand if a team was going to do it for marketing. Now, I'm not saying it's right because I've just seen other teams rush players before. But the Flyers already know they're not a good team for next year. So there is absolutely no reason to put pressure on him to come out and rush things. If the Flyers do this right, they say, hey, listen, this is what we like. We really love what you're doing. Go back another year. Go play with Will Smith. Go try and win a national championship. Be supportive that way. Don't put pressure on him to come out. That's the way I would handle it. Yeah, and I know he puts pressure on himself to be the best of the best, and he wants to kind of fast track his career Mm -hmm. to the NHL. But, yeah, I firmly believe that extra year, uh, you know, especially, like you said, with uh, Will Smith joining the team next year, I think that'll be great for him. And, uh, you know, if you just look at his play, for example, in the bean pot, which just took place, that's a high pressure situation, right? So for those Boston teams, you know, the bragging rights part of it is absolutely huge. And those rivalries are massive. And Boston College lost in the semifinals of that tournament to Harvard. Cutter scored late in the third to tie it up. There was like a minute and a half to go. Um, He took a shot through a ton of traffic that just like, I think it just sort of happened to go in because yeah, of the it was a, it screens. Was a, it, it was one of those goals that it's good that you shot it, but it was a seeing eye goal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, then, you know, Harvard scored with 1.5 seconds left in that overtime to win that game. It was must have been heartbreaking oh, yeah. for, for Boston College. But, you know, you sort of compare Cutter Gautier's play, like you were alluding to earlier, to Nestorenko's play on the team and it was you could see just that extra experience yes. and Nestorenko's goal in that game where he just cut his way through yep. traffic and score like what a beautiful goal in that game and if you sort of compare his play and his acuity to what Cutter Gatier is you can see that Cutter Gatier has the pieces but he really needs to put them together better and time will do that for him yeah no question I mean that's that's a big deal I just always go back to look Jonathan Taves spent two years in college how did that Mm -hmm. work out I mean you gotta just do what you gotta do sometimes yeah yeah Uh, In the consolation game against BU in that tournament, he had two assists. um, And that was really good to see. Um, You know, he was involved in some plays, much like he was, you know, in World Juniors. He's, like, very good at playmaking as part of being on that top line. And as a center, I think, you know, that bodes well for him, you know, to have those sorts of games. Uh, Just side note, Jay O'Brien scored for BU in that game, so... I still feel yeah. like they should sign Joe O'Brien. I've been <laughs> yeah. saying that all along and I'm not moving off of it because it's just, if nothing else, don't lose the asset. Exactly. But uh, you know, that's just a side note, but I, I really think that, you know, we wanted to look at Cutter Gatti's entire season and we still have a little bit more to we go and, the and, and the conference tournaments and, you know, frozen four maybe so we gotta we gotta look at that as well because again those are high pressure situations and we want to see how he can uh perform in them and you know what his role turns out to be and what kind of ice time he's getting in terms of special teams as well um but i think it's you know it's good to take a look at this point in the season and really you know start to see what his path might look like yeah i mean that's that's exactly what we're doing it's like it's a catch-up It's a snapshot, knowing what I know from him before, seeing what I see now. There's definite improvement, but there's room for improvement. That's the other key. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, We will have a lot to talk about on the Friday show. We are going to recap tonight's matchup against the Kraken. Sacrifice some sleep. Sacrifice some sleep. Uh, we've got another late one against the Canucks to talk about, and they've been busy. Uh, some two trade deadline teams wanting to showcase a lot of pieces, yep. I think. So it should, like, could be an interesting matchup, actually, oh, yeah. just 
given all of that. So we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, as a reminder, we always want to hear from you. So send in mailbag questions via Twitter at Lockdown Flyers. You can email us at LockdownFlyers at Gmail, or you can comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Have a great day, everyone.